Hey, it's Jim, and this is FRM Part 1, the topic on financial markets and products, and the chapter on properties of options. Let me quickly remind you that just a few chapters ago, we talked about forward contracts and futures contracts. Later on, we'll talk about swap contracts. But let me just quickly remind you that those are contracts. Those are legal and binding contracts. In other words, when you sign a forward or a futures or a swap contract, you are legally obligated to do something. With options, that's not the case. The definition of an option, as you know from a previous chapter, is the right, but not the obligation. So you have the right to do something, like you have the right to buy or sell, but you also, you also have the right to do nothing. And that right to do nothing, or the right to do something, boy, that layers uh, option properties and option pricing with some pretty unique characteristics that we'll uh, we'll talk about in these in these learning objectives. So we'll we'll look at these six factors. I'll ask you to get your phone out and take a picture. We have a really good slide there. We'll do upper and lower bounds. Uh, the way I interpret these things is kind of like what's the best case scenario, what's the worst case scenario. But what's even more important than understanding upper and lower bounds, look down at the last learning objective there. Uh, we'll need our upper and lower boundaries to understand those potential rationales. And then we'll talk about one of my favorite models out there, put call parity, which is super cool. What it does is it links the equity markets, the fixed income markets, and the derivative markets. And based on what we know from really, really rudimentary economics, we know that trading that goes on in one market influences what goes on in, uh, in other related markets. So we'll spend a little time talking about put call parity. So let's f identify that first, uh, that first learning objective with the six factors. Now, of course, <clears throat> The six factors are the same for both call options, which gives us the right, but not the obligation, to buy an underlying asset, like a share of sock or a barrel of oil. Put option gives us the right, but not the obligation, to sell a share of stock or a barrel of oil. So those six factors are constant for both call and put options, but when those factors change, they're gonna have different impacts on uh, on call options and put options for for some of them all right so you ready uh, the underlying assets price so let's take the simple and obvious example we have a share of stock that is uh trading for a hundred dollars a share and we have both a call option and a put option written on that share of stock that has an exercise price of let's say a hundred dollars so this is known as an at the money option. So if we buy the call option, what are we betting on? We're betting that the underlying asset price goes up. So if the stock price goes up to $110 or $120 or $200, then what happens is that the call price will then increase. On the other hand, if we have a put option giving us the right but not the obligation to sell to sell at $100 when that stock is trading at $100, we're betting that the stock price falls. So if the stock price falls to 80 or 70 or 40 or 10, then that increases uh, the value of our put option. So remember, those two are, uh, are opposites. Uh, look down at the bottom. This concept of intrinsic value is pretty important. It's really just the difference between the two prices that I suggested for a call option. If the price of that share of stock goes up to, what did I say, 120, so then the intrinsic value of that option is just 120 minus the $100 exercise price. So that's a $20 intrinsic value. For a put option, if the share of stock falls to, let's say, $70 a share, then the uh, intrinsic value of the put option is the 100 exercise price minus the 70, which is 30. Notice that there's a max of the difference between those two prices and zero. This is a great exam question, uh, one that I ask regularly. I give the students uh, you know, a scenario and it's an out of the money option. So let's do a put option. So suppose the uh, exercise price is 100 and the stock price goes up to 200. Well, what's the intrinsic value of the option? A lot of students will say, oh, that's $100, 200 minus 100. Ah, but you got to flip it because why on earth, if you own the put option, would you exercise and sell for 100 when you can go to the New York Stock Exchange and sell for 200? 
Now the exercise price or the strike price, uh, these are opposites here. So with the call option, so what did we have earlier? Exercise price of 100. If, if I write another option with an exercise price of 110 or 130 or 150, well, what that means is that my share of stock or my underlying asset has a lower probability of ever finishing in the money. So as the, uh, as the exercise price increases, then the value of the call option decreases and just the opposite for, uh, for the put option. Time to expiration. If you consider an option that expires in five days versus an option that expires in 500 days, all of the other conditions, all of the other terms of the option are identical. Well, you'd probably be willing to pay more for the 500 day option rather than the five day option because right here, watch my hands. What do stock prices do or underlying asset prices do? They go up and they go down. So you have 500 days to get in the money, whereas you only have five days to get in the money for that first one. Now, here's where we need to make certain that we differentiate between the American style options and the European style options. So notice we have two slides here. So let's go over the American style options. So generally what happens here for both the call and the put options will increase as time to expiration increases. We just said that here uh, uh, just a second ago. Now for call options, the longer the time period, it increases that likelihood. And this is what I was saying uh, earlier, but for put options, um, what we need to do is look at it just, you know, from the opposite direction that we have the likelihood that that underlying assets price falls below the strike price. So when I went like this up in, you know, uh, that heading three, when I went like this, I was going like this for the call options way up here and way down here for the uh, put options. Now, however, for European style options, which can only be exercised at maturity, um, there is an extra variable that we need to consider. If there are dividends in there, typically what happens is that there will be a decrease in the underlying assets price when that dividend is X dividend date. So what do we know? We know that if we buy this share stock before the X date, we know that as a shareholder, we're going to receive that dividend. If we buy it after, we don't get that dividend, even though the dividend has not been paid. Yeah, so shorter term options, they might be worth more. And that's especially true if this dividend is, you know, this big. If the dividend is this big, then you probably don't have to worry about it. Now, here's the most fascinating uh, factor, this volatility. Um, you know, think about this extreme example. Suppose that stock price was 100, like in our earlier example. Exercise price was 100. And suppose that we had a 500 day option. And for some crazy reason, you knew that that stock price was going to stay every single day at $100 for the next 500 days. How much would you pay for that option? Well, it's an at the money option. Uh, if you knew the future and you knew that it was going to stay at $500, there's nothing that there's no way that you would pay anything for that option. But suppose we throw in now, hold on, let me go back and clarify something here. If it's a, if that stock price stays $100 for uh, 500 days, the standard deviation is zero, right? How do we measure volatility? One way is to use standard deviation. So with a standard deviation of zero, then we don't really, we're not really interested in that option. But suppose I throw in a 30 or 40% standard deviation, the stock price goes way up and way down. Well, then you're going to pay lots and lots for that option. So with both calls and puts, higher the volatility means the higher the call price and higher the put price. Now, how about this concept of time value of money? What do we know from our very beginnings of pricing a treasury security, pricing a certificate of deposit, pricing these simple discount securities? We know that they're nothing more than present values. Price of a share stock is present value. That was the Gordon growth model. Uh, price of a bond is uh, yeah, present value. A couple different models we can use there. So of course the price of a call option or the price of a put option has to be a function of some interest rate. And so it's going to be the risk free rate of interest. And we'll talk at length about this a little bit today, but a little bit more in, uh, going forward as we get in uh, further advanced into this topic. 
Um, but it's, it's really a strange thing to note that these derivative securities, like a call on a put option, which have tremendous risk, that they can use the risk-free rate of interest to price them. Boy, you have to scratch your head and you say, why? Now, there are a handful of reasons that this is true, but the most glaring of reasons, and these are all mathematically supported, is the simple fact that you can use a share of stock, you can use an option, whether it's a call or a put option, and you can form a risk-free portfolio. This is known as uh, arbitrage-free pricing. So the risk-free rate is super important here. So let's go through both the call and the put. So let's read those first two diamond points. This is important. For call options, as the risk-free rate rises, the value of that call option will increase. What this means is that it increases the cost of holding that underlying asset, making the call option more attractive. So you're gonna be willing to pay more for that call option because, well, what did I say earlier? Stock price 100, exercise price of 100, maybe you just pay $5 for that call option. So you have you have $95, right? You have $95 for to invest. So when interest rates go up, you're happy to own the option because you don't have to hold the underlying asset. But then with the put option, you know, we have to flip this upside down because we're betting that the price falls, price of the underlying asset falls. So as the risk-free rate of uh, increases, the value of the put options will fall. And this has everything to do with opportunity cost. Now, how about dividend payments? I introduced this just a few seconds ago because we had that uh, little bit of a difference with one, one of those factors. So generally, when you own a share of stock and the company pays a dividend, you get it, right? But if you own the right but not the obligation to buy that share of stock, there's no way that the corporation is paying you a dividend. Uh, so when the dividend goes up, then that's going to have a negative impact on call prices because you don't receive the dividend in that derivative market. Now, with the put options, there's an increase in uh, put option prices, and this has everything to do with the ex-dividend date because what's going to happen is that the stock price, the underlying asset price, is going to fall on the ex-dividend date. So that's uh, that's really no good for the call option, but it's good for the put option because you're betting that prices fall. So here's that, uh, here's that slide that I was telling you about earlier. So get your phone out and take a picture of this. I can't imagine that GARP would put together an exam without asking multiple questions here. So go down, think about my example, $100 stock price, $100 exercise price, and then, well, let's just figure this out. So what happens if one of these six factors changes? Then what happens to the call? What happens to the put? And then make sure that you read in the question stem, whether it's European or whether it's American. All right, how about moving on to this concept of lower and upper bounds for non-dividend and dividend-paying stocks? So once again, we're going to have to worry about these two sub-samples. Now, some of these things are so obvious that you might not even uh, think that we need to talk about it, but let's go ahead and, and just quickly discuss this upper bound for a call option. Can you think of a scenario, $100 stock price, $100 exercise price, so you have the right to buy at 100 when the stock is trading at 100, would you ever pay $150 for the right but not the obligation to buy that share of stock? All right, so the upper bound, look there, you know, we got the arrow coming from the origin there. So C is equal to S. So the upper bound is that the call price is, uh, is equal to the stock price. The lower bound is going to be the same thing, same thing. However, however, we know that we can buy that uh, share of stock all the way through the expiration date. That might be five days from now, or it might be 500 days from now, as in my previous example. So what we need to do is take that present value. So the lower bound is going to be um, the difference between the stock price and the present value of the exercise price. Now, what the reading does is go through a little bit of a mathematical proof. Um, I'm not quite sure that this is a great table for you to try to memorize. We have an example uh, to illustrate this in just a second. But what the reading does for us is it puts us inside of the, here, let me go back here quick. It puts us inside of that equation up on the top left 
top right corner of the example. And by the way, that kind of has a little bit of put call parity invested in it there. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So think about rearranging that equation so that look down on the, uh, on the bottom under the purple today. Let's suppose that we buy the call option. So we're out the call premium. There's a minus C. We sell the stock so that we receive the, the proceeds, right? So that's a plus S. And then we lend out the present value of the exercise price. So we have that portfolio. And that, according to, let me just go back here quickly, that according to the lower bound down at the bottom in blue, that is the equation for the lower bound. That thing has to be greater than zero. So that at expiration, then, what you have is you can either have the stock price, so there's S sub T greater than the exercise price, or the stock price is less than the exercise price. So at expiration, you're going to have either zero or the difference between the exercise price and that stock price at expiration, and that has to be greater than zero as well. All right, so let's work through just a quick example here. Look at the top bullet point. We pay... Uh, $5 for the call, stock price is 55, exercise price is 50. So notice the call price is selling for its intrinsic value. We don't like that at all, right? Interest rate is 6%, time is a month. So take the present value. So take 50 divided by 1.06 raised to the 112. So there's the 49.79, I'm sorry, 49.76. So rearranging, so let's go back here to this, the buy the call, sell the stock, and to lend at the risk-free rate of interest. And that's all we're doing in, that, in those middle rows there. So look down at the bottom left. So we buy the call for five. We sell the stock for 55. Remember now, we don't have to own that stock. We could, uh, we could probably borrow it from a margin account. And then we're going to lend the 49.76. So there's today we get 24 cents. And then ex expiration, what's the worst that can happen? Well, we don't owe anybody anything. So we get to keep the 24 cents. And then what do we get to do? We got to invest that at one month at the risk-free rate of interest. Or I suppose we could have taken it to the racetrack and bet it on a horse, but I don't think horse racing and put call parity go together. So we could invest at the risk free rate. So we'll have something more than zero. But then if the stock price is less than the exercise price, and we just have an example there, 48, you get, uh, you get $2. So this would be an illustration of an arbitrage opportunity so that you could do this over and over and over again. And you would always get the 24 cents, assuming these conditions. And then the worst thing would be you get to keep the 24 cents or the best thing is you get to keep the 24 cents plus the interest and then you get another another two dollars so this is going to lead us right into put call parity here in in just a few minutes so this is just a quick example of why why that uh, here let me go back here quickly why that lower bound for the call has to be in place because if it weren't then somebody would be out there uh, making 24 cents and two dollars and by the way uh, this is a zero sum game so somebody would be losing the 24 cents and losing the two dollars and you know you have to be uh you know uh, not fully brained to continue to lose 24 cents and two. Now, notice what we have up in parentheses, I'm sorry, in quotations up there. Um, any other situation uh, permits an instant arbitrage and this concept of an interest arbitrage. So there we go through the middle column with what we've done. But then what? What? We, we get 10 cents. We, we get 10 cents no matter what happens here. Uh, if that call option is selling for its, uh, its less than its intrinsic value. So there's no way that the writer of an option would ever, I mean, look at, let me just remind you of the conditions. Stock price is 55, exercise price is 50. Would the writer of an option ever sell it to you for less than $5? In this case, in this case, $4.90. And the answer is, well, you know, it would have to be uh, an option writer from outer space who doesn't know anything about uh, about call options. There's no way that the writer and remember, most writers of uh, of call and put options are not people like you and me. No offense to your personal wealth, uh, but they're financial institutions. So there's no way there's no way they're going to lose 10 cents. And remember, and remember, you could buy a trillion options on this. All right, so what are these uh, implications? We call these weighty implications, right? So um, 
Call options will always have some time value before they expire. And that's because, that's because there is, here, let me do this, right? So stock, stock prices go way up and down. So even if, even if the exercise price is here and the stock price is way down here and there's only a day left, that call option is probably going to have some time value to it even though it has zero intrinsic value, it's probably going to have some time value because what could happen? In the last second, right, the last second, somebody could make a full court shot on a basketball court and that stock price could then spike all the way up above the exercise price and you say, ah, saved at last. Now remember, what's the equivalent of making a full court shot to win the game in basketball? Well, the, the finance equivalent is to have a failing firm, right? Stock price is falling and then have some acquiring firm come in and say, you know what, we're going to go ahead and buy that and we'll pay you $120 a share of stock, right? Look at the second teardrop point. And so I think this is probably a really good exam question. So the American call will never be exercised before the expiration date because of all the stuff that we just talked about. But think about it this way. You're never going to exercise the call option before it expires because there's time value in it. Now, that doesn't mean that you might not sell the option, right? You can sell it and you would get its time value back. So why would you exercise and, and uh, forego the time value when you can just sell it and get the time value? That should make perfect sense. All right, let's switch over to put options, upper bounds and lower bounds. So notice we have the distinguishing graph here for American and European. So American is in the red. So the uh, upper bound is going to be the exercise price. Uh, you know, think about it. You have the right but not the obligation to buy at 100. I'm sorry, to sell at 100 when the stock is trading at 100. There's no way. What's the worst that can happen? No, I'm sorry. What's the best thing that can happen to you as the put option owner? What's the worst that can happen to the shareholder is that the stock price falls to zero. So there's no way that you would pay $120 for that option when the best you could do is make $100. And then, of course, the lower bound is going to be the difference between the uh, exercise price and the stock price at, as it falls, right? And then for the European options, we need to take present values in there. So that's what we're doing with the 1 plus R. And gosh, I sure hope I don't have to remind you that raising something to the minus T is like dividing, right? Now, what if we throw in the dividend payment in there? Well, all we're going to do is use that as the same equations, but we're going to take out the dividend payment for, for the call option here. So let's just work through a, uh, a quick example. Stock price is 80, exercise price 40, one year, 10%, and the dividend of $5.50 is received in, in, in a half a year. So let's do present value there. That's $5.24. So take the 80 of stock price, take out the uh, price of the option, 524, and then take out the present value of the exercise price. Exercise price was 40, present value is 3636. So that gives us uh, 3840. Well, the intrinsic value is $40 there. Well, this, the call can sell for less than its intrinsic value with no possible arbitrage. But note, note, this is only true because Stock price is 80, exercise price is 40. Notice that fourth teardrop point. Deep in the money, European calls can sell for less than their intrinsic value. So that makes sense. Now let's move on to exercising early, which it depends on what we were talking about just a moment ago. Now, if the option has time value, exercising early would eliminate that value. I've already said that, right? So the only time you're going to exercise it is when it has no time value. So when is that going to be? Well, we need to go ahead and consider that interest rate and taking the, let's go back to my example of the pay the $5, $100 and $100. So we have $95, right? So what do we have? We can generate lots and lots of interest income on that $95. So notice what we have there, loss of potential interest in earnings. So this highlights the need for a substantial dividend payment to cover those early exercise costs. So it's really, it's really marginal cost, marginal benefit between, you know, opportunity costs, let's say, potential losses and, uh, and that dividend payment. 
Let's take a look at the American put option and why it will be exercised early. So let's go ahead and remind ourselves of my example, $100 exercise price, $100 stock price. Suppose that the put option, suppose the stock price falls to $40. So what's that intrinsic value? That intrinsic value is $60, right? $100 minus, minus 40, that's $60. Um, yeah, that put option will probably trade at its intrinsic value. So what you can do is you can go ahead and exercise and get that, you know, remember you settle in cash, get that $60, and then you can earn interest all the way until the option expires. Um, that's really just a time value of money concept. Um, and that's why, and this is a great exam question. Look at that bottom teardrop point. American puts are always worth more than their European equivalents. All right, you ready for put call parity? I was telling you this earlier. This is super exciting stuff. So put call par parity is based on the identicality, is that a word, of two portfolios. Let's suppose that we buy the share of stock. There's the S and we buy a put option on that share of stock, S plus P, right? So there's that portfolio. What do we call that? We pretty much call that, you know, a protective put or portfolio insurance. That portfolio has to have the same payoffs as buying the call option and investing in a risk-free bond. So there's the call, the C, and there's the present value of K. Now K in the original put call parity is going to be the maturity value of a bond, which is always set to equal the exercise price of the put option. So put call parity links the options market, right? There's a, notice there's a C and a P there. The stock market, there's an S. And then the credit markets, there's a K, and that's the present value. And that's what we were doing earlier about, you know, lending at the risk-free rate of interest. And that's the, uh, the, tre the uh, treasury credit market. So look at the diamond point. Let me read that to you. Price of a call option implicitly informs a certain price for the corresponding put option at this with the same exercise price and expiration date. So think about put call parity. You have the call of the put written on that share of stock, and then you buy a risk free bond. So that equation there kind of rearranged a little bit from what I was saying earlier. If you take the C call price minus the put price, that has to be equal to the stock price minus the present value of the exercise price. And that's always just going to be the present value of a, uh, of a risk-free security. Now, what you can do is you can rearrange that formula. You can throw things on the left-hand side of the equal sign or on the right-hand side of the equal sign. Uh, that's called uh, synthetic investing, which we'll talk about at some, uh, some other recording. But look at that equation in the box. That's put call parity. What that is telling us is that the prices for call and put options, which trade in the derivatives market, have to be related to the price of the underlying share of stock, which trades on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, what has to be related to what goes on in the U.S. Treasury market. Those are related, so that's a parity condition. If you violate any of those parity conditions, then there's an opportunity for arbitrage. Now, oh, whoops, I went one too many. All right, so here's another table. I'm not sure if I want you to take a picture of this. I want you to maybe take a picture of the next slide. Um, what happens? What happens if there is a violation, if a violation of that put call parity condition? So you can go through this. All right, so go down the left-hand column. If we sell the call, if we buy the put, if we buy the stock, and if we borrow, what's going to happen is that today we're going to have something more than a dollar, but then at expiration, we're going to have just, I'm sorry, what did I say? I, I misspoke. We're going to have something more than zero, zero dollars, but at expiration, we're going to have zero dollars. So think about this. If there's a violation of the put call parity, we get some money today, but then we don't have to pay anything in the future. Boy, that makes a lot of sense, right? Remember what I said earlier, this is a zero sum game so that if we're making some money, somebody else is losing. All right, so let's do just a quick example. Suppose the call price 750, put price 450, 
Stock price is 44, exercise price 42. So the call option is in the money. The put option is out of the money. Uh, 8%, uh, three months. So we do present value calculations just kind of quickly there. So 41.19. So if you do all the math there, you get uh, $2.81. So let's do this here, right? Sell the call for 750, buy the put for 450, buy the stock for 44, borrow 41.19 to finance the purchase of all that stuff or some of that stuff. And we have 19 cents, but at expiration, if you do all the math, and here, let me go back here. You know, we're so really good at uh, offering explanations in our slide decks. Look at the bottom, read the signs, they matter. Uh, so you get zero dollars. So you have 19 cents today and at expiration, no matter what happens, whether the calls or the puts are in or out of the money, you don't owe anybody anything. Now, there's our put call parity in blue. Skip down for a, and that's for a non-dividend paying stock. So skip down for a, a known dividend. And that's important. You know, we're probably going to do this for a company like Walmart or Johnson & Johnson, which pay regularly quarterly dividends. We're probably not, not going to do it for a company like Jim's Concrete Company, which may never have paid a dividend in the past. It might pay a special dividend here, might pay another one. So this is probably for firms that pay regular dividends. Now, look down at the very bottom, put call parity, it holds out there for American options and European options pretty closely. European options, it's pretty standard, but for American options, because of that discussion we had earlier about the early exercise, then put call parity is thrown right out the window, but I don't wanna say we're throwing it out the window and forgetting about it. All we're really doing is kind of putting it in our hands and going out to the window and looking out, because even for American options, it gives us a really good idea of the interrelationships between and among those markets that I was telling you about. And lo and behold, look at that bottom Bottom, uh, that bottom circle point. It serves as a useful approximation or reference point. So again, we're not throwing it out the window. We're going to keep it close, uh, close here because we love we love put call parity. Now the end of this chapter asks the question: Well, what happens if we don't buy a U.S. Treasury security that matures on the same day? that the options expire. What if we just use a forward contract? Well, this is super simple stuff. And notice that equation there. All we're doing is we're substituting for um, the uh, present value of the treasury bond or treasury security. We're just substituting the forward price. So we can do an example down there and we'll skip to the next page here. So there's present value of the exercise price. Uh, there's present value of the forward price. Throw all that together and you get the uh, price of the put option of $5.24. By the way, you know, if you go back to, let me go back to the, uh, um, you know, this learning objective, explain put call parity and then express it in terms of forward prices. You know, I'm not quite sure that you would need to do this mathematically on the exam, but if you can, just remember that that put call parity equation can be rearranged to solve for any of those four variables on the left-hand side. In this example, we solve for P, we solve for the price of the put option. And so here are the bounds in terms of forward prices. So instead of instead of exercise price, we have forward price. So that should make perfect sense. All right, so that takes us to through our learning objectives. Once again, what I want you to do is go to the end of this chapter. There are 20 questions and they're pretty self-explanatory if you've paid attention over the last, what is this, 40 minutes or so of this recording. So hey, thanks for watching and have a great day and good luck studying.